Slavery had always been a thorn at the side of Americans since the founding of the United States. To unite the nation under the Constitution, slavery had to be one of the great compromises made between the North and the South. However, this issue was never solved. Instead, it was pushed back and back towards subsequent generations. After the era of good feelings and at the onset of the Jacksonian era, early warning signs like the Missouri Compromise indicated that buried sectionalist attitudes were bursting through the cracks and threatening to disunite the Union. Before around 1830, anti-slavery efforts were mostly passive and isolated. Anti-slavery activists mostly advocated for negotiation and conciliation with pro-slavery activists. They preferred gradual abolition and manumission the act of freeing slaves voluntarily by their masters. Others, like free soil advocates, merely wanted to contain slavery and stop it from spreading. Still others, like those supporting the colonization movement, wanted to move free blacks back to Africa. Due to the changing economic landscape, of the Industrial Revolution and the changing religious landscape of the Second Great Awakening, the debate on slavery soon shifted. New anti-slavery groups emerged starting around 1830, which focused on immediate abolition of all slaves. They were active, organized, and utilized effective means of communication, and rode on the wave of religious fervor of the Second Great Awakening. Meanwhile, as the demand of co for cotton rose, Due to improved technology and slaves became more valuable, southern slave owners retaliated with moral and religious justifications for slavery. David Walker, a revolutionary black abolitionist, was one of the greatest embodiments of this new anti-slavery movement. His most well-known work was Appeal, in four articles, together with a preamble to the color citizens of the world, but in particular, and very expressly, to those of the United States of America. Published in 1829, it raised a fiery controversy as it tackled the changing political and social landscape of slavery head-on. Very directly and using provocative language, it repeatedly called for immediate abolition by both whites and blacks to end slavery as an institution. Like many of the new abolitionist movements, religion was a key part of its arguments presented slavery as immoral by the decree of God and threatened its supporters to soon face divine retribution. Motivated by the Second Great Awakening, this stance invigorated slaves and made many whites join abolitionist movements due to fear. Also embodying new abolitionism, Walker's writings advocated for violence, a growing trend in regards to the debates surrounding slavery. In his preamble, Walker wrote, Having traveled over a considerable portion of these United States, the result of my observations has warranted the full and unshaken conviction that we, colored people of these United States, are the most degraded, wretched, and abject set of beings that ever lived since the world began. And I pray God that none like us ever may live again until time shall be no more. They tell us of the Israelites in Egypt, the Helots in Sparta, and of the Roman slaves which last were made up from almost every nation under heaven, whose sufferings under those ancient and heathen nations were in comparison to ours under this enlightened and Christian nation, no more than a cipher. In his opening paragraph, traits of immediate abolitionism were clearly present. During this time, with intensifying debates surrounding the future of slavery, incited particularly by the Missouri Compromise, with many Southerners argued with justification for slavery. One of the chief arguments for slavery, as articulated by Charles Pinckney, was that slavery was justified because all great civilizations in the past had practiced slavery, citing Egypt, Greek, and Rome. Walker, in this paragraph, s explicitly said that the slaves in the United States currently were in a situation far worse than any other civilization in, in the history of society. This claim was based off of how American slavery was based on race, not religion or captured prisoners like many of the other ancient civilizations, so slaves and their children had almost no way to become free. It argued by directly and explicitly pointing out the flaws in the reasoning of advocates of slavery. Furthermore, from this paragraph, the influence of the Second Great Awakening is evident. 
With the repeated mentions of God and Christianity, it revealed that religion was one of the primary motivations behind the moral justification against slavery. In an ironic tone, he declares incredulity at how a Christian American, with emphasis on Christian, of a supposed enlightened and Christian nation, continued to perpetuate this system that was against the teachings of Christianity. Likewise, one of the targets of his arguments were the pro-slavery activists who claimed that slavery was justified because it was allowed to exist under God. Again, following the trend of changing abolitionism, he continues, before I proceed any further, I solicit your notice, brethren, to the foregoing part of Mr. Clay's speech. What this very learned statesman could have been thinking about when he said in his speech, we have been the innocent cause of inflicting, I have never been able to conceive. Are Mr. Clay and the rest of the Americans innocent of the blood and the groans of our fathers, now their children? Now I appeal and ask every citizen of these United States and of the world, both white and black, with any knowledge of Mr. Clay's public labor for these states, do you believe that Mr. Henry Clay, late Secretary of State, and now in Kentucky, is a friend to the black, further than his personal interest extends? Does he care a pinch of snuff about Africa? Would he work in the hot sun to earn his bread if he could make an African work for nothing, particularly if he could keep him in ignorance and make him believe? that God made him for nothing else but to work for him? Is not Mr. Clay a white man and too delicate to work in the hot sun? Here, Walker revealed another characteristic that distinguished new abolitionism from older movements. New abolitionism specifically rejected and criticized those who favored a more gradual approach or more moderate approach to ending slavery. In this case, Walker targets Henry Clay, who was a strong supporter of the colonization movement which sought to move blacks back to Africa. It was hailed as a good moderate approach to slavery and gained a strong backing in the early 1800s, where societies like the American colonization movement were founded. However, later on, more radical abolitionists like David Walker saw this movement as political in nature without real concern of the slaves themselves. In this excerpt, Walker mocked Henry Clay for supporting colonization. He criticized him for not bearing any honest concern towards slaves and how he would not have hesitate to have a slave work for him if he had to. Any association with anti-slavery movements was purely due to political reasons, Walker argued, as Clay never once directly supported abolition. Overall, his arguments was based around the reluctance of previous anti-slavery movements to actually end slavery once and for all. People like Clay and the colonization movement instead sought for compromise in order to preserve political unity rather than actually attack slavery. He employed irony again to further his argument, pointing out the inconsistencies of Clay being a white aristocrat, being part of the group that perpetuated the institution of slavery with the ability and obligation to stop it yet professing innocence at the same time. According to abolitionists, an action and a lack of a strong push for complete abolition was nearly as worse as slavery itself. Furthermore, the religious justification woven throughout Walker's writings was present again, rhetorically asking whether or not whites were created by God to simply sit in, in shade while slaves labored in their stead. This was meant to expose the folly of those claiming Christianity justified slavery and how it goes, instead goes directly against the teachings of God's love of all people, which was particularly stressed during the Second Great Awakening. In his next article, he wrote, Have we any other master but Jesus Christ alone? Is he not their master as well as ours? What right, then, have we to obey and call any other master but himself? How we could be so submissive to a gang of men who we cannot tell whether they are as good as themselves or not, I can never conceive. We solemnly submit to their murderous lashes, to which neither the Indians nor any other people under heaven would submit. No, they would die to a man before they would suffer such things from men who are no better than themselves and perhaps not so good. For while they, the white abolitionists, are working for our complete emancipation, 
We are, by our treachery, wickedness, and deceit, working against ourselves and our children, helping ours and the enemies of God to keep us and our dear little children in the infernal chains of slavery. This excerpt demonstrated the role that blacks themselves were expected to take part of in abolitionism. Throughout most of American history, anti-slavery was predominantly fought for by whites. Blacks were, ironically, denied membership to many anti-slavery societies. But this new movement called for an active rather than passive participation of blacks and even criticized those who did not actively try to attain their own freedom. For example, Walker describes how the part of the problem of slavery was due to the slaves themselves. This was likely referencing the fact that in the South, slaves vastly outnumber the amount of slaveholders, yet they are largely submissive. Walker and the new abolitionist movement called for slave resistance and criticized the slaves that did not resist. He contrasted blacks to Native Americans and how they were not made into slaves on a large scale because they were not as, so, they were not as submissive. Like the criticism of whites who did not take an active role in abolition, blacks who also did not take an active role in abolition were also criticized. This demonstrates how activism created the foundation for new abolitionism. Finally, in this excerpt, Walker uses a technique that made abolitionism so widespread and popular after the 1830s. He writes, Let me make an appeal, brethren, to your hearts for your cordial cooperation in the circulation of the rights of all among us. The utility of such a vehicle rightly conducted cannot be estimated. I hope that the well-informed among us may see the absolute necessity of their cooperation and its universal spread among us. As far as I have seen the writings of this editor, I believe he is not seeking to fill his pockets with money, but has the welfare of his brethren truly at heart. Such men, brethren, ought to be supported by us. Abolitionism grew from isolated campaigns by loosely connected anti-slavery societies to, uni to a unified, organized, and effective group. One of their main tools is communication, as Walker demonstrates. With an increasingly interconnected nation, largely due to the technological advancements and internal improvements, such as roads and canals, communication became easier than ever. Furthermore, the Second Great Awakening provided a huge explosion in organized religion, further uniting anti-slavery activists. Anti-slavery messages, like Walker's, could spread extremely easily, and to slaves as well. Walker wrote that everybody needed to cooperate in order to deliver his message across the country. He casted his support for the pamphlet, Rights of All, written by Samuel Cornish, a black Presbyterian minister. Walker's support of a very distantly connected abolitionist demonstrated the interconnectivity of the abolitionist movement. One abolitionist, like Walker, would support and speak out for another like this minister. This was one of the factors that led to the momentum of the abolitionist movement. Walker's appeal helps reveal the development of abolitionism in this critical time period of the United States. It demonstrates the qualities that made abolitionism in the context of liberation of slaves go from a relatively weak and insignificant force into an influential voice of anti-slavery. Abolitionism became active, unified, and religiously invigorated, and all of this is directly, and all of this is directly referenced through Walker's passionate and explicit attack on slavery. Through this cooperative effort, whom Walker is a founding father for, views towards slavery would change up until the liberation of slaves during the Civil War and well beyond.